Uh, welcome everybody to Wall Street Reporters Investors Discovery Day live stream, uh, February 18th. We're back with Relay Medical, a very exciting company in the health tech space. And of course, as you know, we're looking for those stocks with 10x to 100x upside potential. We've seen already a number of 10 baggers, even a 20, a couple, two or two stocks that are up 20 in the last uh, uh, 18 months. Both are actually in the health space. We had Cytodyne and uh, right now uh, Empower Clinics. So the health, the healthcare space is uh, uh, very auspicious for producing uh, big, you know, stocks with big upsides. So uh, again, we're looking for those stocks which have you know massive market opportunities at a key inflection point, multiple catalysts. Uh, right now, Relay is uh, touching all three of those points. So, I think the point of today's live stream is, please ask, uh, you know, ask uh, Clark your questions, ask Dr. Greenberg your questions, uh, and then decide for yourself if this is going to be that next uh, super stock. So, with that said, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for having us. You know, uh, Clark, we met you last on the last uh, live stream. We had a slight internet thing on our end, so we, we didn't get as much with you as possible. But um, I actually, I'd like to kind of start off with you. You're the CEO of the company, right? And I'm the president. Uh, the, 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 the president, Dr. Guru is the CEO. Okay, we gotta actually we gotta we gotta put the, the tags up. We gotta put the tags up there. Um, okay, so Dr. Greenberg, I want to ask you that you actually invented the technology, right? Yes, Mike. Uh, yes, we did. Okay, so can you can can you talk about kind of like your background and you know how how and why you know the file technology came into being and then you know kind of what you see as, as the opportunity maybe Clark if you want to add anything uh, you know marker that'd be great. Yeah, and Clark and I routinely uh, finish each other's thoughts, so uh, Clark will jump in and I'll do likewise. Uh, my background is uh, I trained in neurosurgery uh, in uh, the U.S. and Canada. Uh, just at the end of that, I uh, decided I wanted to build some technology and ended up becoming an entrepreneur, built the world's largest medical imaging software company, uh, and uh, took the company public on NASDAQ and uh, also on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, about three and a half years after our initial institutional investors invested and at 10 times the share price. And the company was ultimately uh, purchased for over a half a billion dollars, give or take uh, 50, 60 times the, the original share price. So even though I'm a doctor and people call me that. Wait, I, wait, I think wait, back, wait back up. So this is very important. So you have a track record of, of delivering 50x already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also a number of other companies we built all med tech and all uh, and all successful uh, various kinds of exits. Um, met Clark and, and I'll get into this company in a second, but I just want to say that I met Clark and and the team and uh, it was like uh, musicians that instantly knew how to play uh, something powerful together. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, so that's that's my background. Uh, uh, I'm I I'm really a businessman who has a medical degree as opposed to a doctor who became an entrepreneur. But who the hell knows? And it doesn't matter. Uh, Fionet, this, uh, this platform we have here, was created in uh, uh, to manage pandemics. We uh, got a head start on managing pandemics by going to where the pandemics were and perfecting the technology, developing experience with 1 million patients in a variety of pandemics, uh, ranging from Ebola to uh, HIV and a number of other diseases. The platform is disease agnostic. Doesn't matter what the, the disease is. The platform allows the management of testing and triage and tracking without which we will never get control of any pandemic including COVID. it allows that to be done not in hospitals but where but in communities where the people are actually sick it is indispensable to manage a pandemic 
from community settings. And that's what we uh, developed this platform for. When COVID hit, we teamed up uh, with our good friends at Relay in order to bring this to North America and Europe. So, so essentially what you have is, is it's essentially it's, it's, it's a pure play on pandemics. It's, it's, a, it's a pandemic management. It's a turnkey pandemic management system. Oh, Your voice is, I'm sorry, but I, I couldn't hear. Clark, did you hear the question? It was just cut, cut out there, uh, Jack, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we may have some feedback. If there's like, so I, I may have to mute some of the mics because there's, you know, there's sometimes a feedback loop of three, three computers. But okay, so let me try to mute. Okay, but uh, so I was saying basically that that um, that relay essentially is kind of like a a pure play, a pure place pandemics. It's a it's a turnkey pandemic management system, a, a technology, pandemic technology. Yeah, yeah. It, it and what it allows you to, but the key part of it is that uh, it works where people live and work, not, it's, it's meant not for hospitals because there's only a few hospitals, it's meant for workplaces, it's meant for office towers, manufacturing plants, airports, border crossings, schools, pharmacies, small clinics, doctor's offices, wherever um, populations can be accessed within minutes, that's not hospitals. That's where our technology uh, works, and that's where we're deploying it. Okay. And that's yeah, what I, I, you know, the 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 key thing for us in, in getting involved in um, is that this is something that's that's been proven. This is something that has been deployed, has been scaled, um, has clearly, by third party um, uh, analysis, uh, been been beneficial and superior to lab based testing uh, in certain regions because you're able to test them at point of care. And, and you know, the key, the key thing um, that, that was really intriguing uh, to me in, in, in this technology is uh, this was developed, this was cutting edge technology five years ago uh, it, to, to go into the worst possible places to operate and to test. Uh, you know, uh, you're talking about places with um, sanitary issues, lighting issues, um, uh, people issues. You know, you've got, you're you're in areas that uh, there's no real organized uh, government or healthcare systems, and and this was successful in doing that. Um, this is really bringing that standard of care that we're used to having in in uh, in North America and and some of the other places uh, around the world that that have. Uh, um, uh, kind of that level of medicine to these places uh, uh, that didn't in the most critical of times. Uh, COVID, you know, we 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 can't um, we're not going to belittle COVID or underplay what 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 it's uh, what it's doing to the country, the economy, the mental health of everyone, all these things. But I can tell you that you would be hard pressed to find someone who'd rather have uh, Ebola over COVID uh, or malaria or HIV or these things that are just super critical issues uh, that you that you effectively by using our device test in the same way uh, and so a million patients have been tested with this ebola malaria listeria uh you name it uh and now it's taking that product that was that was developed that platform that was developed to operate in the toughest spaces and deploying them in the most ideal spaces which is which is what we're dealing with now in in canada and the us i want to so so just you know, for people who are not familiar with, you know, like some of the kind of the, the, the industry terms that you guys are using. Okay, so point of care. So in other words, I kind of use it as like in the retail world, um, like it's like point of sale. So basically you're getting people, um, uh, you know, out in the field. So like at the airport, wherever it is, they can take the test and you can track it there and that's how you're able to manage it. So that's, is that correct? That, that's exactly correct. Okay, and, and how much of a difference is that? Why is that a big like? Just you know, in layman's terms, why is this important? Like, in other words, I guess, I guess what I really want to ask is, what is what's the hot button for governments, you know, whatever institutions, to want to invest in, you know, buying millions of you know, buying your technology? Uh, if 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 governments uh, governments have so far, and I'm 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 not criticizing any of them. But governments have so far uh, not 
clawed us back into safety from the economic precipices. We are not safe from further economic uh, decline, and I could probably use a stronger word like devastation. We're in the midst of it. There's a lot of people, the three of us here are comfortable. There are a lot of people who are economically not at all. The only way to do that is to get airplanes flying, to get workers working, when workers show up at work, who knows if they have or don't have uh, COVID. If they had the test a week ago at some hospital and show up at work, does that actually do anything? Or should they be tested on their way in? If you had a test six months ago and you're COVID free, should you be getting into an airplane and flying with several hundred other people? Would they want to fly with you? Would the airlines run that, that risk? So there's huge swaths of the economy that depend on people who have been tested negative to get on with, with living again, to get on with working again. Um, in order to do that, you need to be able to do testing at what you called uh, just now, what you talked about, which is the point of care or the point of need. So the, the problems I just solved will not be, or rather the, <laughs> the problems I just mentioned will not be solved by by uh, testing anywhere other than in the community. We are now in a world where we have to take what hospitals can do, make it mobile, make it fast, make it inexpensive, and make it available anywhere. We've done that because we had to do it before and it turns out it it's key here. Should we show a demo? Like show uh, yeah. a video and yeah, you can- Yeah, yeah let, let me-, let me let me just say one thing about it and then uh, please run it. Run it. So uh, not to get too technical, but there are different kinds of testing. One is called a PCR. It's a long a bunch of uh, words, but what a PCR is, it's the current standard of care. A PCR costs between twenty and $40,000 and it can do about one test an hour. Our technology can do 60 tests an hour, six zero. Now, if you wanna to get to populations, let me just translate that for you. So if we wanna do 600,000 people in a day, maybe a number of factories plus some airports, uh, Pearson flies or in, used to fly 130,000 people a day. So if you wanna test 600,000 people an hour or rather a day, you would need approximately 6,000 uh, 6, PCRs at a cost of $20 million or 100 of our devices at a negligible cost. Okay, the way we, you, you see that, the, see so we that. can, yeah, so we can really, what we do is we, we extend, we project the healthcare capability into mass numbers. Um, another way to think about it, and that di leads directly to what I'm, we're going to show you, is, uh, you know, the early cars used to be handmade from start to finish. They could do a couple of cars. They were very nice cars, perfectly done, handmade. Henry Ford made himself a billionaire and transformed the economy by figuring out something called an assembly line. There was a subsequent revolution that even made it bigger called automation. What we've done and what you're about to see is the application of assembly line techniques and automation to testing. And that is how we can get the numbers from to 600,000 with just 100 devices at a negligible cost, meaning it's available for everybody at any time, versus you know hundreds of millions of dollars and a, an impossible number of devices uh, that are currently laboratory mostly laboratory based. So if you if you run the video, I'll try to describe what you see. All right, okay. so this is, okay, okay, so this is. Let me start, let me start. Okay, so okay. Uh, here we go. Okay, so, oh, there you go. So this is an assembly line. This could be at an airport, it could be at a factory entrance, it could be at an office tower. The guy on the right is taking tubes from that pink thing that little pink uh, box, the tubes have the nasal swab that was collected elsewhere. Each nasal swab has a barcode so that it's uniquely identified. 
He's taken one out right now. He's scanning the tube with a barcode reader. Uh, on the device uh, in front of him there is a rapid diagnostic test, an RDT, the thing that we read. Uh, he's putting in the nasal swab contents. All of this has to be done uh, accurately and correctly. And then uh, it looks like the video stopped, but he then puts it into the assembly line just in front of him. Uh, mine is frozen. Ah, okay. Uh, and he slides it. Uh, there's a complex um, factor called incubation time and other kinds of things that are automatically taken care of by the structure of that assembly line. That uh, rapid diagnostic test is then put into the machine. It is uh, perfectly timed so that the results are accurate. Um, and it is also imaged so that it, an archive exists. And so each of those two workers working together can do with one device 60 tests an hour, six zero. And uh, that is, and the device itself automates many of the processes. So the automation actually occurs inside of that device and the assembly line was how we broke up the work and really made a breakthrough in terms of the number of people that you could test an hour. Um, the last thing to mention is that the the cost to the user of this is you know dollars per test so it is economically feasible it is logistically feasible and it works anywhere and it's been proven as clark said one million times in rough and tough parts of the world against diseases that you'd never want to uh, know about Okay, so so the model. Okay, so essentially, so so you're do, okay. So, um, so the device. What what exactly does it do? How does it? How how does the whole thing work? Like, and what, how does the business model work? Business model is that um, we we price it per per test, so per transaction. So it is any. Uh, it's like um, most of the other business models you'd want to in, one would want to invest in. It's a per transaction based model. Uh, each person tested pays a relatively small amount of money. Uh, and yet, because of the sheer volumes, the very thing that makes this logistically possible also makes it an attractive business model uh, for, for us. Uh, what the device does is it um, organizes the workflow, it tracks the workflow, it captures using any cell network anywhere, securely transmits data to all stakeholders, including public health, including the, the people tested, including the employer, including the airlines if it's to do with flights. Um, and uh, it archives all of it so that it's also available for the governments to plan how to manage a pandemic with precision and with timeliness. Everything is geolocalized and heat maps are constantly generated and run. Okay. So it is so, a pandemic management system, not just a test. Okay. Now, uh, so Dr. Groomers, Groomers right? so, so, so that I understand, basically what you're really doing is you're taking the test, which is, let's call it a, um, the, the analog piece and you're, it's the, you're putting it into the digital system. So essentially you're taking the analog system where it's actually valuable and useful. So people, so, you know, the airline can see exactly, you know, automatically there's, it takes out all the friction of people, have, I don't know, show this or that, they see boom, right here, here's a list of the passengers that have been screened. Uh, this guy's good, this guy's good. That's the whole, that's what you do basically. Yeah, add to that two things. Um, one, one is that think about taking a life and death process out of a hospital and putting it into point of need anywhere. Your biggest concern would be quality control. So the device watches over everything and catches every error, corrects it and reports on it. So, so in order to make it available for everybody, we didn't lower quality, we raised quality. And the quality matches what would have happened in a hospital except no longer necessary. And the second thing is it captures data that allow, allows our clients to run their operations with regard to healthcare testing, which is now gonna be a part of operations, just like post 9-11 security became a part of operations. 
and allows them to run that uh, with data. Uh, so they could they they can they could run it effectively and economically. So, so you know, basically, so this is actually one of the kind of this sounds like a boring thing, but like the the, the biggest you know the most profitable areas in technology are things which essentially turn like the the the, the analog physical world into data. <laughs> so it's the that so this is the okay. So basically, this what you're really doing is okay. I, I get it now. Essentially, this this gets all these tests into actually a format that's usable and uh, by again, what you call stakeholders, whether it's government, airlines, whoever needs thousands of tests, and it's all basically, uh, um, uh, it's standardized, we know there's no error, it's all very, it's unif It's uniformity, it's actually usable. Yeah, we're the first to be able to bring large scale mass testing into the community with quality control. The okay. same technology that gives you the quality control captures all the data, and we monetize that as well. Okay, and, and just to back up, I think you said some very interesting things. You, you've actually deployed this. This has been deployed. This is not like some you know crazy invention. It's just, this has actually been deployed in the real world. Uh, you know, with millions of millions of tests. Give us the whole kind of you know, some case studies where it's been used. Sure. And, and what the for. Sure. Uh, in Colombia, there was a horrible outbreak called dengue. You wouldn't want it. Uh, it was in uh, one of their large cities. Uh, people, our device is mobile. They, uh, healthcare workers went into neighborhoods where there was this tremendous outbreak. Uh, they did tests, uh, testing apartment house by apartment house. And since our technology also prints out heat maps, they were able to follow concentration gradients, pinpointed exactly the source of the outbreak drained it, it was a, a small swamp, and the outbreak disappeared. So in addition to diagnosing and treating patients, the government used it to shut down the pandemic. Okay, and you've also done this, I think, in, in Africa, right? Oh yeah, we've done it with in Africa. Um, the Gates Foundation called us to help out when Ebola was um, was wreaking havoc in West Africa. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense has deployed it for some bio threat surveillance in four different continents. Uh, we uh, HIV, the worst pandemic of HIV in the world was in South Africa. The president of South Africa uh, uh, supported our deployment there and um, uh, malaria in in East Africa, and uh, I'm sure there are others. I'm just not not thinking about it. But but they're all the same thing, same technology. As I said, it's disease agnostic. And by the way, um, people sitting in Bethesda, Maryland, near the National Institutes of Health, could see moment to moment, meter to meter progress of the eradication of a pandemic that was uh, our devices were helping in you know a continent away because okay, so real instant gratification basically yeah yeah you yeah if you see the data immediately you can respond immediately and that is why we still are dealing with this pandemic here we haven't been able to respond in real time okay and just uh, to ask, okay so let's say covid i don't you know let's say that goes away how many like is this something ongoing that there's always pandemics, there's always, in other words, I guess the question for investors is, okay, is this like a one-shot deal or is this gonna be something that's gonna be continuously needed for the next 10, you know, 20 years? So um, I'll speak to healthcare markets uh, right now. So first of all, uh, there's no, we're talking to a lot of senior officials ranging from, you know, healthcare people to, people who manage billion dollar a year businesses, nobody sees COVID going away anytime too soon, uh, right? And and most of them do refer to COVID as a 9-11 event. In other words, everything will change forever. Think about the security industry uh, in in towers and airports, you could walk onto your airplane. It, 
it, it's been, you know, a long time, 20 years since 9-11, and we're still doing it. So it'll become part of life. Number two, what COVID is triggering is a mass market shift in healthcare, a, a massive shift. And that shift is the decentralization of services. In other words, things that could only be done in hospitals will now be done in pharmacies. Pharmacies, you know, sell groceries. Uh, they, they do expand their business. In the US, there's 4,000 hospitals, there's 67,000 pharmacies. Pharmacists are the most overtrained healthcare professionals there are in the world for what they do. So they are now doing testing, and I don't think that will stop. They didn't used to be doing testing. So our technology basically allows high quality, digitized healthcare to occur outside of hospitals at almost the same level as inside of hospitals. That is a mega trend. And the decentralized healthcare uh, sector globally is approximately $5 trillion a year. And this directly serves that sector. It sounds I mean, like every. It sounds like you know. Again, you're the right, right place at the right time. Uh, Clark, I want to. You have, you have, you have the device. I think you, you still have it there. If you uh, do, do I have it? I, I, I think Michael's right. gone. I want to do a show and tell because we saw the video, but this is okay. So we got okay. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's great. How does it, how does it connect? Is it like a Wi-Fi? How does it connect to the system? Uh, so because we had to uh, build it for places where there wasn't connectivity, it connects in any way imaginable. If there is a, if there is a, um, a Wi-Fi, it'll do Wi-Fi. If there's an internet, it'll do internet. If there's none of that, it automatically scans for the, any cell signal, grabs hold of it, and securely with encryption trans, uh, transmits. So any place that has a cell phone, never mind any other infrastructure, this works. Okay, so so it's a very it's very robust. I mean, it's really designed for again you deploy in the developing world. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, the, the military uh, tested it by dropping it uh, about fifty times on concrete at, at two meters, and uh, they wouldn't have done the contract with us if it if he, if after fifty drops they couldn't just turn it on and have it work. So it's a it's it's a lovely looking device. It's it's built for uh to military specs okay so it survived the drop test 50 times that's that's a lot of times on to and concrete at two meters wow okay it's like the the old they, timex commercial yeah. takes looking and they, they baked it they put it into a hundred uh percent humidity poured sand over it they tried to beat this poor thing up but it kept working okay okay so let's talk about the business model i don't know who uh, Clark, or who like how do you guys make money? What's the upside potential? Like how, how, how and what are the other uses are there, you know, for, for deploying the, you know, really the technology, it's, what you have really is a technology platform. It goes beyond just, you know, okay. So talk about the big picture. I think that investors want to know like, you know, what's, you know, how big can this be? How fast can it scale? That type of thing. So uh, whoever wants to take that question, Clark. <laughs> Michael, you're on a roll. Why, why don't Why don't you tell us? I, I have. Uh, I, I'll take the last question on um, on summarizing uh, this. But uh, but Michael, why don't you uh, you know you you can really verbalize the scale uh, of this. And if you miss anything, I'm happy to fill in. Thank you, Clark. Although uh, I enjoy hearing you more than I myself. But all right. Um, so um, the business model is a per click fee, so to speak, except these aren't clicks. So it's consider it a per test uh, fee. Um, the rationale for that is that for anyone like software, for any one buyer, it may not be a lot of money. For the mass of users, it, it is a lot of money for us. So what's not a lot of money for the user turns out to be a ton of money for us. If we're talking about, you know, you could do arithmetic and uh, depends on volumes, all kinds of stuff. But if, 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 if a facility is doing 6,000 tests per day, because they may have that many uh, staff to, uh, in an airport, the, the number is way higher, at $3 per test, that's, that's, that's a, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per day for, for us. 
So, so that is the financial model. There are uh, certain uh, niceties about it that we could uh, um, talk about later. Uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the market, I think the post COVID market is roughly $80 billion. Because uh, I just mentioned there's for real medical. 80 billion for real and medical or total? Well, the total, the total market for, for, for a platform that does what we do, I think is approximately that globally. So it's, it's a global uh, platform. So all players together, I think we are first movers. I, but more importantly, we'll shortly be first to scale. I always like being first mover, but I always love being first to scale uh, because there are then network effects uh, as you, and there's the potential to become a standard. That's always the goal. Um, and so, uh, so I think we have, um, uh, I, I think we're sort of, it's a virgin continent and I think we've landed and I think we have the gear and the equipment and the scalability to take a large part of that continent. Now, with such a large continent, I'm sure there'll be um, lots of followers, but there's lots of room, I think. Um, uh, and then there's probably going to be, I mean, with this, we're talking about stock markets. There's also going to be lots of opportunities for exits. The, for, the, for the mega companies who want to move into digitized, decentralized healthcare, they'll do what they normally do, which is to buy companies. Um, but uh, we aim to build this as big as uh, as we can, as fast as we can. Yeah, it's, it's something you said something very interesting. Uh, so for, it's uh, uh, first first to scale versus first to market. Very, that's a very you know that that's really the formula for you know Facebook for Google. You know that's that's the magic. Uh, that's kind of the magic formula here. Um, so basically, we're not shy about about, about we're not shy about that. That's our goal. That's what we're doing. It's more than a goal. Okay, so uh, so you actually are first. So you're basically first to first to market now, but you also you're, the goal is to be first to scale with this. We and, and, and will be active for a big player to buy. We surely will. Yeah, we surely will be. We surely will be first to scale. Okay. And, um, okay. How? What? Do you, what? Um, what kind of like how? How fast can you get traction in the market? I mean, like, do you have any projections? Like, what can you be doing in revenues? Let's say, is it possible to make a projection at this point? Like, you know, 12 months out? Like, what kind of numbers can you generate? It's possible to make a projection, but it's not possible to provide it. <laughs> we, we, uh, we are working on uh, a number. We, uh, you know, we're approaching this very strategically, and we're working on uh, a couple of very important uh, deployments, uh, which will then lead to, uh, to others. So yeah, uh, we're deep We're we, we've been fortunate, uh, to be recognized by potential clients, uh, and we're converting those right now. And then, uh, also building the capacity to scale for those clients and then others like them. Okay. We've identified... Go ahead. So who, who, so who's your, who's your customer? Who's, Who's who's your customer? Is it, is it airlines, bank, uh, you know, uh, government? Who's writing the check? Uh, so there, we've identified approximately two dozen markets. So we may also uh, partner up with other companies to serve them. So I'll just mention a few of them. But so one is the uh, the the airport market. Uh, anything what we've targeted strategically is any market that itself enables huge economies either to recover or keeps them from recovering uh, that's what we've targeted first so in order to so airlines or airports rather are critical to economic recovery we're betting on doing well as we enable economic recovery via the provision of health care but what we're really doing is enabling economic recovery so uh, I think um, there's the, uh, you know, there's obviously the airline industry. We're also keeping an eye past that, you know, there, and then there's, there's related industries, you know, um, entertainment and cruising industries, pick industries that have been hit very, very hard, whose survival depends on getting back on their feet. 
but can't because they don't know who has COVID and who doesn't. So we've, and wherever we, we go, uh, we, we get a very good reception. Um, as well, for a little bit down the line, as I mentioned before, pharmacies are very important because I think they'll be the ones that will take up testing in a large way after COVID. Prior to COVID, no pharmacy was doing testing. In the US and Canada and in the EU, laws were passed allowing them, which means pharmacies are now getting into healthcare. Look how great they are at, uh, at, at what they do as a business. So we're betting on that uh, as well, and we'll be there to serve them. Okay. You know, I, I, I want to kind of get back to um, the market opportunity. Uh, so in terms of in your background, uh, you mentioned you had an exit that was it was like a 50x. So how does this, how, I guess the question is, how does Relay compare to, you know, what that was? What what business, what was the name of the company? Give us the whole, and how does Relay compare? So we'll kind of, kind of see if there's a connection to these. If, if, if uh, lightning strike twice. It's not, yeah, but you know, uh, first of all, one is always fortunate. A million times one is fortunate. But when you come to work, we, we are co-located uh, uh, and you see how hard people here at Relay are working. Uh, it's not lightning striking, it's people striking, uh, people sparking, people creating that, that energy. Um, the first company was that I built was uh, a software company not 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 very different um it we 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 made a couple of key strategic deals with key buyers such as we're doing right now and when they got announced everybody else was a little surprised and then as always happens you know other people followed and then others followed them and before you knew it uh we were growing at 20 percent a quarter for uh, 10 quarters in a row and culminating with, with an exit. Okay. And the, and that was what, so it was, and what was the, what was the, what was the name of the company? Sidera, uh, C like a cedar tree, C E D A R A software. Okay. And, and that, and that, so that the exit was 50 taught 50 X from where it went public. No, it was 50 X from when the first institutional investor put in money. Okay, so uh, yeah, so they put in money, like yeah, close to like a dollar fifty was like a share, a, and it was bought at fifty something do dollars per share. Bought out at fifty bucks. Uh, yeah, yeah. When was that? Uh, two two thousand four. Two thousand. Okay, okay. So so this uh, you, know, uh, you know fifty bucks a share back then it was still you know real money, right? Uh, two thousand four. Oh, $550 million, whatever that would be today, probably twice that. I don't know. Uh, so so I, I guess the audience is probably asking, okay, can, can, can a really medical be, you know, what's the path for a really medical to be bought out for $50 a share? Is there such a path? What's the path to get there? Clark, anybody wants to chime in? I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think that's a, it's a pretty loaded question. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I think... Uh, Really, if you look at specifically what we're doing right now and, and what makes what we're doing investable, um, there's really three three key points that you can drive home on that. I mean, number one is from a technology risk uh, perspective. Uh, this has been scaled. This has been deployed in the worst possible places. It's been deployed and it was successful. And those that that success was documented by third party. Um, the market. Uh, is absolutely enormous. And it, it's, it's a very difficult question actually to answer because um, we as a company, uh, obviously our focus has been scaling, uh, updating the, the, the technology for new COVID tests, these type of things, and also for, um, uh, you know, developing something to be operating in a, uh, uh, an atmosphere that's out kind of outside or out in the field as compared to um, what we're doing in North America, which is you're looking at these key markets where you are looking to, to set up what is essentially an assembly line to run a bunch of tests through. You're not in a lab, but you are somewhere that is not traditionally a healthcare focused place, like as Michael's uh, using some, some examples uh, 
related to workplaces, manufacturing, um, cruise ships, airports, all those things. But the market is 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 huge. It's enormous, and and we're actually right now we're focus uh, we're really forced to focus on the key markets that will will show us the biggest ROI uh, because we just can't afford to to run down the path of every opportunity that comes in front, no matter how big the name or how interesting the in industry is. Uh, but the market's enormous, and this is not testing. It's a, not a testing company. It's an infrastructure company. Uh, as Michael said, um, this has been a, a defining event, COVID. Uh, just as September 11th defined what's happened in national security and things have changed, this is a defining event for healthcare, for healthcare privacy, for what our expectations are around testing and sharing that data and uh, and getting tested and screening uh, um, multiple times to make sure that when you get on your flight or you get on your bus or wherever you're going, uh, that, that the chances are very low that you're going to contract something. Uh, but, but as they say, uh, this is about infrastructure and our platform isn't just one device and a software, it's a whole platform that you can wire in other testing uh, methodologies, other devices, so that you can manage everything holistically. Um, so we, we can implement ourselves into a, into a place that has, look, we're not a silver bullet. Uh, there are no silver bullets. It's going to take a number of solutions. And we have actually designed this, or I should say Michael has designed this platform to integrate with those. So we can offer holistic solutions, no matter what the client, the size, shape, uh, uh, or the difference or, or uh, specificity that's required. So the market is enormous. The third thing is for us, the time is right. Uh, the time is right. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I call Michael Kreskin or, or, or whatever, but um, so far he's been pretty uh, pretty damn good at predicting uh, where things are going. And and right now we've uh, we've we've spent the last few months. We got a deal done. We started to uh, to to work together to get this thing to accelerate this thing towards market. Uh, the work's been done. We're well capitalized now. And what Michael had had uh, had mentioned and and had kind of predicted as we started this is that you're going to see a shift in these, uh, these regulators, these healthcare organizations are going to shift from PCR and there's gonna be a lot of talking about antigen testing because it's the only way that you can test and screen people at, in large numbers, quickly, effectively, a low error rate, um, um, results you can rely on so that you can, you can really um, uh, get back to going to church or going to school or going to work uh, or, or going to family functions and seeing your mother or your father or whomever in, in, uh, in a senior care facility. So the technology is proven, the market is enormous, the time is right uh, for us. And now that we are in that scale mode and that commercial mode, I think you're going to see that uh, um, you know, can't make any predictions on share price. You know that that's something that we can't do. Uh, but I think you will see uh, in the short in a short period of time that we've we've generated a tremendous amount of value, and that uh, uh, this is not just a COVID uh, COVID solution. It's not a COVID play. Um, we can test for anything. We can test using any manufacturer, and we can test uh, as new tests, new functionalities come to market. We can implement them uh, with our system. And I can tell you, the contracts and the clients and the the solutions that we're offering, uh, these contracts are not, or these engagements are not. Uh, let's let's work for the next six months and test because the vaccine's going to come in and everything's going to be great. It's looking at the next five, ten years of what is now going to be uh, what is now a post-COVID world. Uh, we need to test. We need to screen. We need to keep our people safe. Uh, we need to get our economies back to school, uh, back to work. Uh, we need to get things th things moving. It's now's the time, or or the damage that'll be done will not be uh, manageable or reversible. So, so that's that's what I can offer as far as our our collective uh, value potential, uh, and I think we're going to prove that uh, soon. You're going to see that that uh, uh, the momentum is on our side, and and the circumstances are changing uh, from a government regulatory uh, standpoint uh, to support us. Okay, uh, let's jump in. one thing to Clark uh, is vaccines are also our platform is equally useful for tracking and following vaccines. And when you do vaccines, the only concern is, is the virus going to evolve away from that? But we could do both of those. OK, uh, so let's jump into some audience questions. First one is, um, have you teamed up with the Canadian government for these tests yet? Uh, so uh, our, our next deployment um, will involve Canadian government tests. 
that when you say Canadian government tests, um, maybe I shouldn't ask what the. Um, I can I can probably frame it. Um, I could probably frame it a little better, Michael. Is uh, essentially that's 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 an interesting question. There's multi uh, multi facets to it, uh, depending on how you interpret it. Um, the answer of tests with the Canadian government, uh, as as Canada is set up right now, um, uh, there is one effectively one test in the market, one antigen test, and you've got to work with the government in order to uh, in order to get your hands on those tests. Uh, so uh, that answer we could say is uh, is yes. You know we we. We are working with the tests that uh, that the government um, uh, has uh, has approved uh, through various uh, um, uh, engagements. Um, as far as um, uh, partnerships or or anything with the government, uh, there is a long-standing uh, relationship with FIO and the Canadian uh, government from a support uh, support side um, uh, in the kind of uh, grants and the that kind of area. Um, but I think that's that's the only way we can answer that question for now. Okay. Uh, Nir is asking, there is some error, percentage error coming with PCR. What's your uh, text, you know, per error percentage? Uh, so our technology uh, works with uh, other tests. So when we are deployed alongside PCR, we are the infrastructure that captures, unifies the data, links it to other uh, patient questionnaires, and, uh, and then relays the data. So our device doesn't have, uh, is not a test itself. And when we work with rapid diagnostic tests, whatever the manufacturer of that rapid diagnostic test error is, that would be ours. What we do is we assure that um, when, whether it's a PCR or especially if it's a, a rapid diagnostic test, when they're used, we, uh, we assure that those tests perform to that manufacturer's uh, stated uh, levels. So, so we should add there as well, uh, Michael. Just without getting too 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 into it, um, but that was really uh, uh, or has been really a, a big value add of of the technology um, because uh, RDTs are um, uh, interpreted manually. Uh, they involve human beings to uh, take the biological uh, sample, deposit on the test, and then interpret and, and record those results. Um, because of that, you're opening up for for a lot of errors. You're also doing it in in um, uh, in the field, so you know I, on ideal lighting circumstances, and you're PPE'd up and all those things. Um, that's really part of the the key value that our device uh, provides is um, it cuts down those errors. It checks as use, it uses uh, machine learning and and machine vision to to check for not only errors by the user but also by the manufacturer. So the the error rate that that uh, uh, is kind of well accepted in the medical community that may come along with some of these static um, uh, point of care or, or, or you know out in the field tests. Um, uh, our device has been developed, uh, designed, and proven um, to actually reduce those errors down to the absolute uh, uh, minimum. Okay, uh, we get a question here. Uh, can you provide that content? I guess the test results. To a uh, digital ID company, so we got some. We got we have previous guest was in the kind of digital ID space. Uh, can you do that? Can, can you have like a seamless uh, connection? Yeah. We. Um, uh, sorry, Michael. I, I, I you, can, go ahead, uh, you you go ahead. Um, uh, I guess the short answer is is um, is yes that this is something that's on our radar. Um, not familiar with uh, the the previous guest, although. Um, uh, it was an interesting uh, presentation uh, that I caught, um, but um, uh, yes, this is this is very much in the field of of, of what may be coming uh, from us in the near future. But I'll but I'll I'll pass it along to Michael. Yeah, in all in all of our deployments, including the upcoming ones, um, we always integrate with other people's uh, databases. It could be a public health uh, database. It could be an electronic health record. Uh, and, um, and, and so that connectivity is built into the platform. It's one of the things the platform does. So we're, we're constantly performing analytics and we're constantly streaming our data to wherever our client likes to keep their data. They can also access our data anytime. And these connections are made once and then they operate automatically from uh, there forward. So 100% yes. Uh, so this is this, this uh, seamless connectivity, basically, to databases, the whole, I, and that's really the value. I mean, this is the whole, look, there's, 
There, you know, there's multi-billion dollar, you know, software companies that all they do is just their whole business is just connecting, you know, some one piece thing to another, which you know, because of different databases, you know, they're, you know, they're just not compatible. So this, exactly. so, if you look across healthcare and look at all the uncountable amount of data that's there, that's connected from here to there, almost all of it is from hospitals. What we represent, I think, first is to capture data from non-hospitals where data is not digitized largely, capture it, uh, analyze it, and send it off to uh, a receiver somewhere. Okay, uh, good question. Uh, any major contracts in the pipeline? I get question of the day. Clark, you're muted. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I, cause this, I, I, sorry, Clark. I, because oh, the, good thing, because I, I slipped there and I said something I shouldn't, so that's great. That you're, you're right on it, Jack. You're right on it. Um, uh, you know, there's no, no, no proper way to answer the question. We, we, um, we're feeling very good about how things are progressing and, and we're at the stage in which we will be, um, uh, working with, with larger, larger companies here in, in, uh, in the near term. So, um, uh, you know, as, 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 uh, as disclosure dictates, um, when, uh, when there are, uh, partnerships that are completed and, and, uh, relationships that are, um, um, uh, are contractually agreed to, uh, the market will know about them. Okay. Uh, Ramsey, is, Ram, Ramsey is asking, uh, so you mentioned the military, I guess your, your product was built to military specs. Is that a military contract or maybe if you can clarify? Huh? Oh, so I, I guess Mike. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so Ramsey is asking. You mentioned the military. I think that the, that the, the technology was built to military specs. He wants to clarify: was a military contract or just built? You know, what is what does that mean? So uh, there are a few things I can say about it. Uh, one is that its purpose is to detect bio threats that would affect the um, uh, the, the military personnel in the field. Uh, it's been used. In, in four different continents. They've published some, uh, some uh, output of it. One of the interesting things that I think will also ultimately um, make its way into the civilian world is that whereas most of these COVID tests and others test for one thing at a time, the military developed a test that can test for six diseases at a time uh, or nine or, or more. And, you know, there are some funky uh, diseases uh, as well that are on there. And our technology can can handle that. Uh, so we also um, think that in time, those kinds of tests will be widespread here as well. We're already, we, we've already read those kinds of tests. So bio threat surveillance is probably the, as much as I can say. Uh, I don't know, okay, so if, if COVID test, is, is COVID testing gonna matter if we're all gonna be vaccinated? Are you COVID proof? A COVID is this a COVID past, post COVID? Well, um, you know, it's a connected world. There is a lot of people going to be traveling from all kinds of countries, and the only time testing will no longer matter. I can't actually foresee that, but it's going to until everybody is vaccinated. Uh, you're going to need uh, you're going to need testing. Uh, and everybody isn't going to be immediately vaccinated. But even after they're vaccinated, it's crucial to do continue to do testing to make sure that the disease stays under control. That's how other pandemics are, ma are, are managed. So, and then for vaccination distribution and tracking, how do you know somebody's been vaccinated? Uh, they have to have some kind of record of it. We also can handle that. So we don't see vaccination making... Uh, Vaccination is just another part of our business as it evolves. Okay. Uh, upcoming catalysts. Um, so, so from from a catalyst perspective, I think um, the real setup here is that uh, uh, we've just closed our our, our financing. We're, we're capitalized. Uh, we've been working together to to uh, to scale as soon as possible and to to customize some of the features and and add additional solutions for um, specific clients or industries uh, and so a lot of that is going uh, I believe going to come to the market here shortly um, with uh, 
with some of these deployments that uh, that that are in the works and um, and some of these partnerships. Uh, from a broader relay perspective, um, uh, we have uh, another asset that uh, that is on its way uh, um, to going public itself. Uh, that's that's turning around in the next we uh, three weeks, four weeks uh, generally, um, and uh, we have uh, uh, lots more in the works that will come. Uh, shortly here now that now that the capital raise is complete and and um, um, we're uh, we're in a position to to really scale up and 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 execute on these things. Okay, um, you know I, I'd like to actually, uh, uh, Dr. Greenberg, I want to ask you. Um, usually we ask this on uh, we haven't had you on before, so I usually ask uh, the CEOs this is. Where, where do you see the company? You know, three years from now, what is you know wh you know what is really going to look like? Well, I, it, it should be Clark who speaks for 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 relay. So, um, Clark. Well, I think I think I think what we should really talk about is where where um, you know Michael and you touch you touched on it with uh, with the vaccination question because that really is something that's hanging out there. People say, okay, this 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 technology seems like it's great um, and it's it's tailor made built uh, built for the time, um, but how long is this going to last? And so the next three years is actually a pretty uh, uh, it's a pretty convenient timeline to talk about this. Um, I think it was the National Post yesterday uh, said that they uh, that to you know to button up and be be prepared that um, COVID is going to be around for the next uh, four or five years. Or um, I believe if you speak with medical personnel, if you really uh, look into how these things work, um, the world is a very big place. And, and thanks to travel, um, uh, people move around and, and they come from countries that may not have access to the same levels of healthcare that we do. And you have strains, uh, you know, this is still a very new um, uh, uh, issue for us. We don't know if this is going to be, uh, you know, you're going to vaccinate the public and this is something that's no longer worried about, which which is going to take years to do anyways. And and, and the, the real third point is, um, this this is really brought to to the world's attention uh, how we are exposed, um, how how the most developed nations and economies in the world are exposed uh, to to a virus, and 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 we were caught with our pants down. Uh, the U.S., Canada, you really can't look around and find anybody who had the infrastructure uh, in place uh, or the or, or what was needed in place to handle. Certainly not to give the public uh, the the confidence that they should that their their senior uh, uh, government officials have their their interests uh, um, uh, taken care of in a situation like this and what we do is really offer that infrastructure because there will be a covid 20 and a covid 21 or 20 uh, a 22 there will be other uh, diseases and issues that that we have here um, this is now in our it's now in in um, you know it's in in everybody's mindset and we've had, you know, we saw H1N1 not that long ago and, and the effect that it had on, on the economy temporarily and uh, from a media perspective, a lot of uh, hysteria and, and, and issues. The next one that comes across, the next one that blows across the ocean and lands here um, will be met with the same anxieties and the same, the same uh, hysteria and we better have uh, uh, technologies and platforms and solutions in place to manage those. Uh, otherwise, you know, we can't go through this again. And, and that's a big part of, of what we're doing uh, with Fionet. Um, uh, we can talk about COVID all day long because it's going to be a problem that that uh, that we're going to be involved involved in managing, uh, uh, involved in managing the next uh, two three years uh, for sure. But there's there's there are other threats out there, and we do need to be prepared. And we offer a unique solution to, to do and that. And uh, maybe it's somewhat less exciting because it's not about pandemics, but it is just as exciting if you focus on dollars. Uh, COVID did something irreversible. It will not, not go back. Uh, pharmacies in this country that have tried for a long time to be able to do provide some more health care, but never could, now can, and it's not gonna, they're not going to give it up. In the United States, as I said, 67,000 pharmacies were not places that could do testing, ordinary testing. You had to go to a doctor, you had to go to a lab. Um, post COVID, there will be, there is already, uh, and it won't go back, a tsunami shift of decentralized healthcare services, grabbed hold of by people 
who can provide those services more inexpensively and to their own profit, so they're not going to give it up. Our platform enables them to do that with traceability, with quality control, and with uh, real-time reporting. It's a platform for where healthcare is going, whether uh, it's for COVID-21 or just ordinary services that will be provided outside of hospitals. Um, wow. <laughs> so I was going to, I was going to, you know, it's fine. I was about to ask you what are the top reasons to, you know, we usually ask you, you know, what top reasons for investors to, you know, in their opinion, to get stock and that you kind of touched it yeah, pretty much. That was a, a, you know, very, very, you know, very, very uh, great answer for that. Uh, let me just actually, I want to ask, we've got a, just one audience question. Uh, any, you know, revenues expected for the year? Like what's, what's kind of the, the, any, any projections that you can make right now? 18 months. Oh, sorry, sorry, hang on, hang on. Clark, wait, 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 wait. Clark, yeah, sorry, I, 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 could, I have it, you had mute before because of the, the feedback. No, no, no problem at all, no problem at all. Um, no, no, no projections right now. Um, uh, I'm hoping that, that disclosures as they come will, um, uh, will help paint that picture. But uh, as you know, as we are, um, as we are uh, making that uh, transition from a pre-revenue company uh, to a to a commercial company at Relay on multiple assets, um, it's a very uh, um, it's a very sensitive time when it comes to to making any statements about about revenues. Um, I think that will become much much clearer in the next uh, uh, within this quarter. Um, we we should be able to kind of flesh out uh, what that could look like um, through through the proper disclosure channels, and I know that's a that's a PC answer, but uh, but we we do have to be careful. Okay, so I'm going to ask a last question. Both of you guys can you know, which is yeah, kind of touching on before you, you can can kind of come in as as you you know uh, as you'd like. So you know, the last question we're going to ask in these live streams is you know, in your opinion. What are the top three reasons why investors, you know, should consider, uh, you know, relay medical? Michael Greenberg, Michael Greenberg, Michael Greenberg. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I can say that I think I think uh, we kind of touched on them. Um, um, one is, uh, you know, when you look at these things, you look at the the, the risk and the technology risk uh, is low. We've we've shown uh, this has been well demonstrated, recorded that this is a platform that has value that that. Uh, uh, that offers a very unique uh, solution to to a, a problem that used to exist in other places and now is is on our front door. Um, number two, the market is enormous. So if we if we can make a, just a, a small impact in the market, um, uh, this will be a success for investors. And and three, which really puts the first two into context, which is the time is right. Um, we we now are in a position where we've spent the time to to uh, start the scale up process, uh, to make sure that we have products and a system to deliver. Uh, we're, ca we're well capitalized and the market and the regulatory landscape has opened up uh, and is showing that, that it's uh, um, the only way uh, that, that this will effectively be managed is by the use of, uh, of antigen tests and devices and solutions like ours, which, which offer holistic testing solutions in, in large quantities, accurate, at, co at a costing uh, um, uh, situation that that can be done anywhere. At, uh, you're talking, you know, you know when you're at it, adding dollars to a plane ticket or dollars to a uh, cruise, uh, a few dollars, and that means that you can you can cruise or you can get on your flight with the uh, uh, confidence that that you're not going to land on the other end with uh, with a virus. Um, that that five bucks, ten bucks, whatever it comes down to, becomes very affordable. And and the the whole business of screening and of testing is doing these things multiple times uh, to 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 track, use that data, monetize that data on our end uh, later. And so. Uh, it's a unique space and time where we, we seem to have um, uh, the critical issues uh, lined up and we're ready to execute and, and uh, uh, we're pretty confident in, in our ability to perform. Okay, uh, Dr. Greenberg. Um, I, I, I agree with Clark. Um, I would say that uh, there is an enormous market. The word enormous has been used a bunch of times today, not just by us. Uh, and it is like discovering a new continent. 
uh, it's really quite an, uh, um, amazing to look out at the sheer size of decentralized healthcare and be able to serve that in a new way. And COVID put us all there. So it's a very big market. Second thing is we are, um, we have a unique solution and we're shortly uh, first to scale, which will result in a database for every test we make, we capture a ton of data as well, which will result in one of the largest, if not the largest uh, database for decentralized healthcare, now fed by all kinds of parties that aren't hospitals. And that's where most of the population is. So big market first to scale. Um, and, and third, I think the asset we will have by virtue of the first two will make us very coveted. And not only by uh, very large concerns they, that would want that, uh, but also by very large concerns that would not want that in the hands of one of their competitors. So big market, first to scale, and a coveted asset as a result. Um, three good reasons. I, I like, <laughs> like it. Okay. Uh, guys, on that note, I want to thank you. Um, yeah, for get, you know, sharing the story, kind of doing, you know, sharing the video so we can kind of see how it works. And uh, I think everybody in their audience is looking to uh, more news, seeing, seeing, you know, how how fast uh, you're scaling this. So, so we'll we'll have you back on the next live stream. Oh, clock, I clock, I sorry, I had you mute. Okay. no problem. I, I said thank you very much, Jack. We we appreciate it and. Uh, Always good catching up, and we look forward to um, to updates in the future. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for joining our live stream today, and we'll see you in the next one.